Hey guys, what's up? Rebecca here. It's been a while since I made a video. The last videos I made were about insurance. And now that debt's all paid off. Yay! Big shout out to everybody that helped me with that. Look, I got new equipment. I got a microphone. I'm big time it now. Yeah. Anyway, so I before I tell the story, this is gonna be about um the documentary, the docuseries, The Lady in the Dale. And I loved it. I, it opened my eyes up to things that I'd never thought about, um, feelings that I've never considered for others, you know, for the trans community, um, and just some insight about how they were treated many, many years ago. And I didn't even think that, honestly, being trans was a thing years ago. I thought it was something that was kind of new, and I know, don't judge me, a little background on me is, obviously I'm from Alabama, hence the accent, and... Also, I was raised Mormon, and, you know, Mormons are very conservative, and I'm not knocking them in any way, very conservative. I mean, you don't wear sleeveless things, you don't wear dresses, you know, above the knee, you don't date until you're in groups at age 16, you pretty much do things that are church-related when, as far as dating goes, um, like you go to church dances and stuff like that to meet other people. So it's a different community. You're not exposed to a lot. It's very, very family oriented and protected, I guess I would say. So you're not exposed to a lot of things that are like worldly and might be out there, I guess. I don't know. That was just my experience. So anyway, this Lady in the Dell story is like, blow your mind if you're me and I'm me. So I'm going to try to speak slow because I always have people say, can you go a little slower when I talk? Because I get excited and then I say just a bunch of random shit and people are like, what the fuck did you just say? Excuse me. Um, so this story is about Jerry Dean Michael. He was born in 1927 and somewhere around the age of 40-ish realized that he was, you know, actually meant to be a woman or was a woman all along or however that worked. So he becomes Elizabeth Geraldine Carmichael. And the Dell part of the story is about the automobile, the three wheel automobile, the Dell. And the two combined, it's just like a lot. It's a lot. So this story involves lots of marriages, many, many children, the FBI, crimes, um, tax evasion, which I guess that's a crime too, and cancer, and most, I guess, important to me of all was the trans community. Like, I learned a lot about the trans community, and so I recommend to everybody, whether you believe in trans or believe in, you know, the LBGT community or not, it's very, like, open your mind and hear these people out because you don't know what it's like to be them and they don't know what it's like to be me. So anyway, Jerry Dean, Car uh, excuse me, Jerry Dean Michael was born in 1927 in Jasonville, Indiana. And, you know, later they moved to Detroit, his family. Um, and he died in 2004. So the first time he was married, he was while he was stationed in Germany, he went to be in the military. He, you know, gets married to this lady named Mar Margot, I believe it was, and they have two kids, and he just kind of runs off and deserts them. And remember this, because later in the story, it's going to be like, he deserted his kids? Hmm, that's suspect. But anyway, so he's charged with desertion uh, of his wife and kids, and he's, um, you know, pays a $1,000 fine, and he's sent to one to three um, years in an Indiana reformatory and his sentence was suspended and he was released and basically he just pays this fine and you know moves on. Well then in 1954 he marries uh, Juanita Hazeman and <laughs> he's always been kind of a suspect character according to the um, documentary and he didn't it's like he would work, but he didn't want to work like a real job. He wanted to like, you know, do the get rich quick schemes and 
finagle and finesse his way into some money, but not necessarily do it the right way. So with Juanita, he sells these um, mini machines. I don't know what they are. I don't know what a mini machine is. But and he promises these people when they buy it, you know, I'm going to come back around and buy whatever you make, whatever product you come up with, with So, just had a phone call from my mom wanting to know what I thought about her putting my dad's toupee, no, wig, on his on her head, what she would look like if she had this particular do. It's a don't. And I had to tell her that. She doesn't believe me. So, man, I wish I would have recorded that. That would have been good content. Because it was pretty funny. Yeah. Some people need bangs. My mom is one of them. Anyway, that's not about the story. The story here is about Geraldine Michael, who turns into, or becomes, or whatever, Elizabeth Geraldine Carl Michael, and that's what's important here. So, backing it up. So, he's married to this Juanita woman. He is selling these machines and lying to these people, probably mostly women, that he's going to come back and buy whatever products they make with this many machines, and doesn't. So, over the course, by the way, this guy moves a lot, like a lot. Like I was in a military family and or was raised in a military family and we moved all the time, all the time, like at least every two years, sometimes more often. Yeah, lots of moving. This guy has me beat. He, it, Juanita was quoted, his second wife, was quoted as saying, you know, that in the course of their um, three-year marriage that they moved at least 21 times. Like, holy shit, that's a lot of time. That's a lot of moving, you know? I hate moving. I think it's because of the military. But I could be wrong. Anyway, so those two, they have two kids. So now we're up to four kids. He's got four kids between these two marriages. And, you know, at some point in time, they move somewhere. And he creates this newspaper. And, unfortunately, it's an unsuccessful newspaper. But he had, he retains the equipment, like, so that he can continue to print whatever newspapers and stuff like that, but he just kind of abandons the building and the, you know, newspaper company, I guess, itself. So, then he goes to work um, for United Vacuum Cleaners as a salesman, and it's here that they're like, oh my gosh, you know, he was so great. He had lots of knowledge about the vacuums, about how to fix them, about how to sell them, just a wealth of knowledge, right? And he's gonna, he's just rocking it out. Well... Not so much. Turns out, a homeboy who uh, likes to kind of manipulate people and use their money or take them for their money, he ends up getting fired. And he gets fired because he's taking people's down payment for the vacuum cleaners and just pocketing it. Not even, you know, put, applying anything towards it. He just straight up pockets the money for the vacuum cleaners. And I guess he gets caught somehow. Some way. So, at some point in time during all this madness, he gets a divorce from his second wife, and mind you, he has four kids. So, then he marries his 30, third wife, and her name is Betty Sweet, and he marries her in 1958. Um, and basically, after four weeks, he's in trouble with the law again. So, he's like wanting to go on the run. Well, they have a kid, and he never saw or had anything to do with this kid. So now we're up to five kids. And mind you, the lady in Germany, Margot, or whatever her name was, they had two kids. He was jailed for abandoning them. And now he's got this, you know, he had the second wife. And he's, you know, obviously left her or they, you know, dissolved their marriage, whatever. And then he's got this third wife. And they're not, you know, married long before he runs into trouble with the law. They have a kid. And he never sees that daughter. Didn't have anything to do with her. Suspect, right? I'm like, how are you not going to have anything to do with your kid? I don't know. I don't understand that. I don't have that problem. Well, then, however longer later, he marries, finds his fourth wife, Vivian, and she's 16 at the time that they meet. And together, they end up having five children. So, how many kids is that? Like nine? He's got the two from Germany, the one from the Juanita. Nope, two from Juanita. The one kid from Betty, and then five. He's got ten kids. Dude has ten kids in total. Oh my gosh. Like, damn, he's very potent. Like, he has some swimmers. 
I don't want an encounter with him, you know, if I could have had an encounter with him. Because Lord have mercy, you're going to get pregnant. Anyway, so this Vivian is like his ride or die. Like, it doesn't matter what they've gotten into. She's down for him. Like, she love loves him. They have these kids together. They homeschool them together. They obviously travel all the time. And the reason why is because, well, let's back the story up. So, they get married, obviously, young. He, you know, they move, they run off to California. Vivian and, at this time, Jerry. Um, so, Vivian and Jeremy, Jerry, they run off to California. She ends up getting knocked up, and she's like, oh, my God, what do I do? So, she calls her parents mom's like what do I do and they she basically says hey the house next door is free why don't you come here and live so they do they move back to uh, wherever the heck this is and they move to his next door you know next door to her her parents and it's here that I think that they put the printing press or whatever it was the printers that he was using to make papers at one point in time newspapers to work so they start um, printing money. They start printing money. Um, and before that even, he teaches her, Vivian's younger brother, um, Mr. Barrett, how to, like, write fake checks and go cash them. So they've got, like, this check writing printer of sorts. And they, you know, gets him involved. And this, like, 16-year-old, her little 16-year-old brother driving a brand new Lincoln what the heck ever car like looking like he's making money and you know I guess the authorities caught on to it and they're like whoa knock 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 what do you guys got going on here and well brother's like ah, I don't know and um Jerry's like don't worry about this I got this he's very confident in his abilities and he studies and reads a lot of law books and feels like dude I've got this so they go to court I don't think anything ever came of it but little brother, Vivian's little brother is like, well, pump the brakes. Like, yeah, you got out of it. I don't want this life for myself. I don't want to be involved, so to speak. So, um, and then years later or however longer later, they decide to um, make this fake money. Okay, so we've got um, Vivian, who's pregnant, and we have uh homeboy jerry dean who he's already got caught in the check scheme so he's probably like what the crap what do i do to make money so mind you he owned this printing press or newspaper so he has printers to print things uh, so they decide to create this la distribution company office or headquarters or whatever and it's there that they print um fake money in five, ten, and twenty dollar denominations. Well, Vivian's like, "Hey, boo, it doesn't look real. We gotta, we gotta do something to make this look real." So it's her. She decides to stain the money with coffee and tea to help it look more real, more realistic. Maybe dirty it up. I don't know. So then he employs, I guess you would say, or recruits people to pass off as fake, fake money, get the change back, and. You know, that's kind of how the scheme works. So, um, when they get caught, the break comes in the case because David Iceman is caught. And, of course, he rats them out. I'm like, this wasn't my idea. It's these people's idea. So, on August 4th, August 4th, 1961, Vivian and Jerry are taken into custody by the FBI. In their Venata Hills home, and I guess they, you know, what is it? What's it called? Or you know, like they question you and stuff. They interrogate them. They interrogate them. They interrogate them. And they're like, so what happened? What's the plan? What's the scheme? How did this happen? And Jerry, being the guy that he is, stand up guy. He always takes the fall. He doesn't want other people to get in trouble for things that were, I guess, his idea or his scheme. I don't, I don't know. 
So he takes the fall. They're let go. And um, so this is on the 4th. On August 30th, a federal grand jury indicts them. And instead of, you know, doing the right thing and going to court, they're like, eh, Vivian's pregnant. What do we do? So on September 18th, they fail to appear in U.S. District Court in L.A. for arraignment. And, of course, a bench warrant was issued, and they're on the run. Um, I've got notes. <laughs> cheat, cheat. Anyway, so they're on the run. They're released on bail. Um, while they were released on bail, rather. And the whole, you know, kit and caboodle behind that is that, you know, Vivian's pregnant. Of course we're going to go on the run. We don't want to go and go to prison. I want to, supposedly, you know, he wants to be, I guess, part of his kid's life even though he doesn't really have anything to do with his other children. Anyway, so like every two months or even two weeks, they they move because they're like, you know, they're on us. Um, and over this course, over the course of time, while they're on the run, you know, like I said, they have five children. Like, oh my gosh, they have five children. Like, how do you even do that? Did they get, you know, have them in a hospital? I don't know. The story doesn't tell. But it does say that um, the way that the children were named or got birth certificates and stuff was that they actually would skim um, newspapers for deceased, recently deceased infants. And then they would write off to um, Vital Records for a copy of the birth certificate. And then they would make the Social Security card for this, you know, deceased infant and use the birth certificate and that's how they became you know whatever their the different kids names were um which is just I mean that's just crazy in, of it, uh, in and of itself because can you imagine like you don't even have your real you don't even have your own identity because you know they might have called you whatever but they also had to refer to you as you know Jane Doe or Carmen Electra, or whatever name they wanted to give you based on, you know, what babies were recently deceased. Like, how crazy is that? Can you imagine? You know, I mean, do you, like, do you even know who you are? I, I feel like I wouldn't know who I am. But anyway, so during this time, you know, they're on the run. They do a lot of camping. Sometimes they live in houses. Sometimes they live in really nice houses. And I think that, you know, Jerry would kind of work odds and ends jobs, things that paid cash. But at one point in time, they lived in Birmingham, Alabama. Got my attention. Anyway, they live in Birmingham, Alabama, and they have a um, an exotic pet store. So they had like monkeys and like tropical fish and you know this, that, and the other. Well, Jerry realizes that fish multiply. I don't know if they mate or how that works, but like he realized that they these fish are worth a lot of money. So he could get these exotic fish, you know, from whatever country bring them here and he could convince he managed to convince people to create a uh, like use their their basements even in the story it says and and you know basically create an aquarium for these fish to breed and then he would turn around and sell them and I guess like give them a cut of the money or something like that but I mean isn't that that's kind of genius like these exotic fish that are actually you know bred here in the United States. Like, that's kind of wild. So, um, meanwhile, you know, they're on the run, and there was no real, like, the FBI would tap their phones and stuff if they did have a phone. So, the only real way that they could communicate with, like, family was to put a classified ad in a newspaper, like, with strange things. And you just have to watch the documentary to see and to understand it's freaking genius. It's a genius way to speak to your family when you're on the run. <laughs> I don't care who you are, what you say. It's genius. So, um, the, you know, Vivian and Jerry, they teach their kids, like, what to expect, like, things that were suspect, you know, like, if you see the cops coming and knocking on doors, like, we gotta run. If you hear clicking on the phone, we're probably being tapped, and that also meant they need you to run again, right? So, like, they were schooling their kids, you know, they did teach them to read and write, like, together uh, as a couple, but they also taught them, like, how to be suspect, how to, you know, 
I guess, gauge danger, gauge if the cops were on to them. And I don't know if they, the kids knew that they were on the run or, like, how that works, but, yeah, they taught them, they taught them, you know, what to, what to look out for. And they would run away, you know, in the middle of the night a lot of times. It's just wild. Like, I can't imagine being a kid subject to that. But, um... Later on, um, in the in the documentary, the one of the daughters is talking about how her, you know, Jerry Dean had come up with like this jacuzzi bathtub jacuzzi thing, and it was like a little machine that sat on the edge of your bathtub, and it would bubble and stir the water, and you know, like make a jacuzzi. And that idea sold for a lot of money, but because you know her dad, because they were on the run, you know, lost this idea. I guess the idea was stolen or whatever, and. How crappy was that? Because she was thinking, oh my goodness, it's going to be a big deal and we're going to make all this money and life's going to be normal. No. Shit was stolen. So, um, he also, it's also said that he had mob connections. Um, and that comes into play if you watch it. Like, I'm obsessed with mobs. I'm obsessed with crime. Especially true crime. I'm into all that kind of stuff. So, I was like, what? Mob ties? That's cool. I mean, it's not cool, but it's like, that's cool. Anyway, so um, because of his mob connections and the FBI like knew, I guess, about this, he decides like, shit, I'm going to fake my own death. I'm in all this trouble. We're on the road. I want to live a normal life. I guess I want to give my kids a normal life, whatever. So he decides to fake his death. And what does he do? He makes it look like a mob death. So he like runs his car off the side of the road, flashes his own blood in the car, shoots the car. Looks like a mob hit, right? The cops are a little suspect of it, but, you know, it could be tied to him, and they're thinking, well, maybe he died. So, Vivian's family's contacted, and they're, like, told, you know, hey, he's died. Um, and instead of grieving, her brother, Vivian's brother, had already actually received a call from him, like, saying, hey, you're going to hear some things that are not true. Basically hangs up. I'm going to find out this is probably what's not true. He's not really dead. So eventually, you know, he reaches out to her brother and definitely, definitely not dead. But, um, so <laughs> Jerry didn't let Richard get in any trouble. So Richard kind of feels like he owes him, you know, like, hey, you saved my butt. You know, if you ever need anything, like, I feel like I kind of owe you. Not to mention the fact that it's Vivian's brother. So after all this happens, they're still on the run. He needs money. Jerry and Vivian need money. So he calls you know, calls Richard up, like, hey, need some money, can you help me out, and Richard's like, sure, because, you know, he feels obligated, well, um, sometime, you know, while they're on the run, and sometime after this, in 1966, you know, he started this conversation with his kids, you know, start starting to transition from being a man to a woman, and from being dad to mom, and during this transition, you know, he gets his kids first to call him, you know, Aunt, um, Aunt Liz, and then eventually they start calling him Mom, and Vivian kind of takes a back seat as mother, and now she's Aunt Vivian. Um, but the thing is, is that <laughs> when Vivian was first told by Jerry that he, you know, just had this feeling that he wasn't really living his true life and being himself as far as, like, sexually goes, he had a conversation with her and she didn't take it very well. She was very, very upset. And basically she just runs off, goes stay somewhere. And they do keep in contact. I guess he had her address or something. So he writes her a letter and basically pours his heart out like, I love you. I've always loved you. You're something special to me. And, you know, me having these feelings inside that I'm, you know, not supposed to be a man, that I'm supposed to be a woman. It's not a reflection of our love or our marriage or our commitment to one of each one another. It's it's me on the inside. I still love you very much. Well, anyway, so she, you know, I guess she thinks long and hard about that. She kept the letter, but she thinks long and hard about it and and decides to stay with him, right or die, right? So she stays with him, and they raise their kids in this environment where she's, you know, Aunt Vivian or Aunt Viv, and he's Mom Liz Elizabeth, and. Um, she helps him, like, she helps him, you know, with his hair, with, with her makeup, with, 
the transition in general with getting hormones, getting started with the transition process. Like, she's just there the whole time, ride or die. And God bless that woman because I can't, I personally can't imagine being in that situation. But I think when you really truly love someone and they come to you with this, it's like, how can you in your heart just not want to help? Like, how can you not want to help? How can you want to abandon them in their time of, well, in my mind, in their time of need, you know? So she helps them, you know, dress and get like the girdles and stuff to hold in, you know, before he, you know, starts the transition to hold in kind of his stomach and his package down there. And um, just with the whole process, like she's, I mean, in my opinion, she's kind of awesome for that. I mean, I don't know very many people that would stay true to somebody in that situation. So um, he starts taking the hormones. He started, you know, to dress as a woman and go out as a woman and, you know, living as a woman, you know, and um, the kids say that he was she. I'm going to start referring to Jerry as she and Elizabeth because I feel like that's just the respectful thing to do because that's how she wanted to live her life was as Liz. So anyway, Elizabeth, or excuse me, Liz goes, you know, she's starting taking the hormones. She um, eventually, you know, goes to Mexico and starts the transition process where I think she, um, I, I want to say gets castrated and also gets um, uh, breast enhancement or um, fake boobs. I, I, mean, I don't know the technical term. I can't think of it right this second because I'm on the spot. But anyway, so she has this done and, um, like, starts the process. And because of this, think about this. This is like, this is 1966. There are people today when we see somebody dressed, you know, in opposite sex clothes, I guess, or with makeup if they're a man or, you know, kind of weird if they have what we would call, you know, a dot haircut or something like that. We you know, make judgments. We pass judgments on them. Some people do, not everybody. But anyway, so can you imagine in 1966, you've got this six foot, 200 something pound man, and now she's wearing dresses and, you know, acting as a lady and things like that. Can you imagine trying to find a job? So that opened up my eyes to, you know, just discrimination of housing, employment, just discrimination period against trans people. And they go over that in this documentary, and it's literally, it's so, it's mind-boggling, but it's like, such, it's refreshing too, because, you know, there's so many discriminations going on in the world, but like, I never would have considered this to, to be even a thing, and I don't know why it didn't cross my mind, that maybe it's my reason, but whatever. So, she finds this guy, his name is Sam Schlissman, I think that's how you pronounce it. Anyway, he gives her a car or fixes her car or something like that, puts a phone in it, and, you know, she's employed with his real estate firm, and apparently she's really good at it, and they get into marketing together, like this marketing and PR firm, and it's while working there that she learns about patents and investors and just really, like, gains a whole bunch of knowledge, like, in this, you know, in that particular field. And it's also there, working with Sam and at this PR firm, her marketing firm, that she learns about, you know, the three-wheel car. And so she sets up a meeting with, you know, the this gentleman named Dale. And he's, um, he's the one that um, created it. And of course, it was kind of more like a motorcycle that kind of turned dune buggy kind of thing. And she kind of takes the idea and runs with it. Anyway, so she takes the idea and runs with it. She hooks up a meeting with him and you know, this Dale can get like, and I guess it's based off of like a motorcycle engine. To me, the car's not really that interesting. I mean, it is. Like the fact that a car could get 70 miles per gallon, especially back then when cars were only getting 8 to 12 miles per gallon. I mean, that's cool, but to me, it's like not really the biggest part of the story for me. It was not really what I walked away with. Cool car concept, but not really the biggest, you know, part of the story. Anyway, so this guy named Dale Cliff, um... He was on the show called The Big Idea, and he was the original creator of this um, three-wheel car. And again, it's based off of the motorcycle concept, the small engine, and whatever. Well, he meets with um, Elizabeth Carmichael, 
and they hit it off and you know she's like hey you know let us buy this idea basically from you we'll call it the Dell you know just to kind of put the Austin on the cake like we'll name it after you kind of thing <sighs> like anyway so we're gonna name the car after you help us help you and um, so because of this Elizabeth now creates this company called the 20th Center Century Motor back that up so Liz now creates because she's got this Dell idea um, and she obviously has been learning about investors and look what we have I think anyway so while working for this marketing and PR company she learns about the Dell she goes to the creator which is Dell Clift and it's like hey I want your idea so then she takes the plans buys the plans whatever says I'm gonna call it the Dell It'll be the icing on the cake. We'll go down in history as this man that's helped us create this 70 mile per gallon car, free will car at that. He agrees, whatever. So she opens up the 20th Century Motor Car Corp and it's on Ventura Boulevard. And if you know anything about California, by the way, I did live in California from like 2006 to 2009. But anyway, um, if you know anything about California, you know Ventura Boulevard is the place to be. So pretty cool that she's there, right? So she's taking in investments on this car because people are like, there's a gas shortage. Cars are only getting eight to 12 you know, miles per gallon and there's a gas shortage. What do we do? So people are more preempt to invest in this car and invest in this company and you know what Liz is trying to do and yada, yada, yada. So Liz hires some young, inexperienced engineers, but she also hires some very experienced engineers you know, to, to create this deal. Um, very highly regarded professionals in some of his areas. And the Dale itself, like the prototype, I guess, was featured in the LA Auto Show, which is pretty cool. So people are like getting hyped up. They're like, oh my gosh, we're about to have this car. Yay. Um, well, as news <laughs> gets around, here comes these two investigators, investigative journalists, maybe. Or maybe just on night news kind of thing. I don't know. Dick Carlson is one of the characters. Or I don't want to say characters. He is a news reporter. And he... I think he's a little bit of a dick. His name rings true, okay? He's a little bit of a dick. And also there's Dennis Smith and Pete Knowles. And those are the people also from the news company. From, I guess, the news station or whatever. So they're involved in the story. So remember those names because you're going to hear them later. Anyway, so while Liz is trying to create this, you know, whole Dell thing and taking in investors and stuff like that, her kids say that she was just, she was a wonderful mother. She was very nurturing. She might have worked long hours, but she always made time for Sunday picnics. And she was just like the epitome of what you would want your mom to be. Loving and caring and involved and whatever. Well, Liz starts making these claims, you know, as far as the Dell goes, that she's, you know, she's a self-proclaimed genius and, you know, that she's going to knock the big three, you know, like, I guess, like GM, Ford, and Chevy. I, I don't know who the big three are. <laughs> I feel like I should know that, but I don't. But anyway, so she's going to knock these people on their, you know, knock their socks off, basically, and make them go bankrupt or whatever, because she's just, she's got this plan. Anyway, so when she creates this company, she also invites that Sam Schlissman to come work with her as the PR guy. And um, the, uh, as such, with Sam Schlissman, Sam, 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 Sam Schlissman, um, he hires, because he's the PR guy, he hires a guy named Colin, um, Danger? Mm, I don't know. I think that's his name. Anyway, and he gets them, you know, to do a lot of press releases, a lot of coverage on this Dale. So this car featured her, or this guy featured her and the, the Dale, the car, in over 160 publications in 30 countries. Like, oh my gosh. So this got a lot of coverage. I mean, that's a lot of coverage. 30 countries? Like, I didn't even know there were 30 countries. Um, so 
So it gets plenty of coverage, but also you see her, you hear her voice, you see she's kind of a, she doesn't look very feminine yet. You know, she's in the process of transitioning and stuff, and she doesn't quite look feminine. She doesn't quite sound manly, but people kind of her, really. Um, and she promises to produce 88,000 cars in year one, which she was saying, you know, by 1975, they're going to have this thing rolled out, and they're going to have already produced um, 88,000 cars. And then she's going to open up two more um, factories so they can continue producing, you know, their locations, you know, help people get jobs and stuff like that. And she also makes the claim that the plastic itself was the same as, uh, same type as was used on a spacecraft. And the plastic was, quote, nine times stronger than steel. And she also claimed that it was unbreakable. And, you know, had people try to break it and yada yada. And also made the um, crazy claim that it was bulletproof or that a bullet couldn't shatter it. But a couple of the engineers get together and they shoot it with a 357 Magnum. And it does break. She works. So, I think she left that one. Let that one slip. I, I don't know. Anyway, so, <clears throat> she tends to, like, believe her own lies. And I don't know if that makes her a pathological liar or what. Because sometimes I feel like I believe my own lies. I think if you're going to tell a lie, you got to try to believe it. Anyway, so, people comment that she tends to believe her own lies. And she claims that she's driven the Dale into concrete walls at 30, 40, and 50 miles per hour. And the only thing that happened basically was little um, superficial damage, scratches and such, like no damage, no damage to her, which is kind of ludicrous if you think about it. And she also claims to have driven it into the ocean at one point in time. I mean, <laughs> when I say these things out loud, I'm just like, how could anybody have really believed that stuff? I mean, it just... It even sounds ludicrous. I don't know. But um, employees started noticing that, you know, they didn't feel like they had adequate equipment to even manufacture the car. And then it turns out, like, you know, she just, people would basically donate money to the company and she would just let them come work. They have no idea how to manufacture or engineer or do any part of building a car or creating one or whatever like they don't know anything but they just like hey here's my money and I'm gonna come work and so they're just kind of standing around it's like a whole bunch of people standing around nobody's really doing anything and this car is not really getting made because nobody knows what they're doing there's no process there's no you know deadline or steps to take along the way it's just the whole thing's crazy but um she so she claims, like I said earlier, that she graduated with a degree, a degree in mechanical engineering, and she said that she went to Ohio University. Um, but later, that's determined to be a lie also. She also claims, now this part I actually do believe, because she had so many people just excited about this Dale and the possibility of this car, you know, that gets, you know, 70 miles per gallon and just the whole gas shortage and all that stuff. She had people really, truly believing in this. So she claims to have been taken in, taking in about thirty thousand dollars a day, like pretty much cash. It sounds ludicrous, but then it's like I can totally see, you know, people just buying into the idea and just like, here, take my money, do with it what you will, make a car, hopefully, fingers crossed, whatever, I'll come work for you. So, um, yeah, <laughs> with all these reports and everything that are going on. I've mentioned them several times, you know, there's this guy named Dick Carlson, and um, he knows, I think he was like the um, the boss, maybe, I don't know, and Dennis Smith, I think, was the videographer or something like that. Anyway, so Dick and Dennis, they decide they're going to do a story on the deal, and, you know, they get to go sit with um, Liz Carmichael and just talk about her and talk about the deal just kind of do a report on the whole situation. Well, um, this is also, by the way, at the height of like all these feminism things that are happening, like people, different people are coming forward and there's like a feminism movement, I guess. And um, so 
seeing kind of a, a more masculine Liz, I guess they didn't really call it into question in the beginning because it was like, you know, not a lot of women were in a powerful position. And the fact that she was kind of fed into, I guess, the feminism movement, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So while, while, I'm going to work on enunciating my words, while Dick and Dennis are waiting to interview Liz Carmichael, they see an intelligence officer in the waiting room and they're like, hey, what are you doing here? And he's like, oh, you know, um, I'm basically just looking to uh, make nice with an employee so I can get some insider information. So they're like, well, that's a little suspect, but they also don't think anything about it because everybody was kind of into this whole Dale Carr story and what was going on. Let's get my page here. It's a little funny. I don't know. And they decide to kind of dig more into it and find out what's going on. So they're like, you know what, let's uh, let's find out what's going on in the back, how the manufacturing's going, because things seem a little suspect with her. Let's, let's find out. Let's investigate. So they ask, you know, if they can, you know, she agrees to let them do a tour of the manufacturing facility or whatever. And so they go and they talk to some of the employees and some of the employees comment, you know, that there were three men kind of in this facility wearing really nice suits and they look like they were they were just very they were heavily intimidating kind of just hovering over like you know here you got these nice men in suits it's like who are you an investor are you with the mob who are, who are you and um i guess they kind of made comments about being a little nervous about them and during this filming dick and dennis had the idea to you know let's get a former an engineer an automobile engineer in here and see if they even have the right equipment let's just see if if what they're saying is going on is even really going on so you know they do their filming and then afterward they kind of stop in a parking lot talk to this former engineer and he's like it doesn't even look like they have the right equipment they don't have the right equipment it looked to be like a toyota engine in there and just nothing everything about it seems suspect like you they there's no way that they could be making this car or if they are that's not really what was going on during this film and when it comes out once the you know once dick and um dennis hear what that engineer had to say and that he didn't feel like they were really manufacturing the car or that a good effort wasn't really being made and that they didn't even have the right equipment it kind of busts the story wide open and this is when Nick decides he's going to really dig his heels in and find out what's going on with this car, with this lady, whatever. So um, Dick finds out that options to purchase um, options for the for the Dale are being sold, and it was being sold to the masses. Like people would make deposits, and when you are investing in something the money has to be held in escrow you can't just spend it you can't use it to pay salaries you can't use it all willy-nilly you know it's it's um the money's to be held that's all i can say about it so it's supposed to be held in an escrow account and dick finds out that it's not being held in escrow so they get basically um 20th century motor corp in trouble and they are sent letters to cease and desist, you know, the selling of these options to purchase. And the SEC requires that the money be held or that the contract, it be stated in the contract that the people can get their money back. And that's the SEC period. I mean, if you're selling um, an option to purchase, that has to be part of it, as does, you know, having the money in escrow. Well, <laughs> this fires Liz up and she's like, all the, you know, the government's just coming after me and harassing me and, you know, just doing everything they can to stop this production because of the big three. Like, the big three has all this power, and they probably do. Um, so, she has issued these orders to stop selling it, but then here comes Dick, Dick and Dennis, and they're like, let's just see if they stop selling them. Well, lo and behold, they, you know, Dennis goes in there and is able to purchase an option 
two out of our, and they take his check and yada yada. Well, then they, you know, put it all over the news that they're selling these options and they're not supposed to be. And so that stops like this influx of cash that Liz has been using supposedly to, you know, pay her employees. And by the way, it was noted by the employees that she, they would always be paid on Fridays with cash. So you would walk in her office and she would have all these evenly divided sacks of money and a gun sitting there too and her two bodyguards and would just pay them in cash. Like most of the time you'd get a check, go cash your check at your bank or whatever. Not here. She was paying cash. So anyway, they, they shut down her funding and, um, yeah, Pete and, Dick, Pete and Dick, Dick and Dennis are really just kind of on her about this, which don't get me wrong. Like, you know, if you're supposed to keep the money in escrow, you're supposed to keep the money in escrow. If you're supposed to stop selling stuff, you need to stop selling it. I mean, but the whole thing is, is that it shut down her operation. So, you know, I guess this is going to go to court or whatever. And Liz is really upset at Dick for, you know, just keeping on after her. So she sends somebody, one of her employees gets to one of the employees at the uh, newsroom or the news company or whatever the heck, and basically she sends money to bribe, to try in an attempt to bribe Dick into just quit talking about her, quit talking about the car, just quit, quit, quit focusing on her and quit reporting about it or the operations and yada yada. Is he going to do that? No. Because why? Because I'm sick. <laughs> anyway, okay. So this prompts Dick to find out more about her. So he discovers that she has lied about her credentials. He decides to call the school and, you know, find out, does she even really have a degree in mechanical engineering? Does she even really go to school there? So she, he investigates, lo and behold, she's lied. She didn't go to the University of Ohio, Ohio nor did she graduate um, with a master's from the University of Miami. So he's even more suspicious about what is going on. Who is this woman? So, um, yeah. yeah. As he's digging, he finds out that he can't find any records tracing back to her basically before she just pops up in, you know, there in California with this car. And, you know, there's just nothing on her. It's just like she just magically appeared out of nowhere. So, in the meantime, you know, all of Liz's funding for this car has been shut down. So she's desperate for funding and she breaks, begs, you know, her brother-in-law, Charles, um, for the money. I think I said earlier that his name was Richard, but I haven't noted here that his name's Charles. So anyway, this person, Richard or Charles, <laughs> his brother-in-law, he contacts him and he's like, you know, hey, I need some money and just begging him, you know, to come out there and help, come out here and basically like save the day. Well, Charles is like, you know, I can't. I can't drop my career. I've got a really good thing going here. I've got a wife and kids and just this kind of awesome thing going for myself. And I don't want to just up and leave it. So, you know, unfortunately, he turns him down. And I think that's when, you know, he realized that it was pretty bad. Like things were kind of getting desperate. And also Liz is probably really feeling the desperation too. And then, you know, when the money's not coming in, they're still supposed to be working on this and she still has all these employees on payroll. So they start not getting paid and, you know, they're marching in her office and freaking the freak out because we're not getting paid. But they also really truly believe in this story that Liz has sold them and just the impact that the car would have and just this great thing that they're doing and that the government's so against them and yada, yada, yada. So she, you know, basically tells them like, we're, we're, we're waiting on these Japanese investors, you know, they're going to come and they're going to see us test drive the car and they're going to just love it. And we're going to have this investment and things are going to be fine. Just like keep working on it, keep working on it, keep working on it. And so she sets a deadline of December 30, 31st, 1974 as this deadline. They're going to do this test drive. We got to have the car. You know, it doesn't have to be in pristine condition, but we have to have the car up and running 
you know, engine tires, everything, the body ready to go for this test drive on December 31st, 74. So, you know, her employees kind of expected her to, you know, basically get these Japanese investors money and, and, and run away. But then they kind of were like half like, you know, maybe she won't. Maybe she's going to get this Japanese investors money and we're going to really, you know, finish this thing up and we're going to be so happy that we took part in this you know, major historical event because it's going to be, you know, such a life-changing thing for so many people because, I mean, hello, 70 miles per gallon, what? And um, so they believe in her and they work, work, work until, you know, the um, the deadline. Well, they decide to, you know, who's going to do the the test drive? And they, the two leading in engineers, and I couldn't think of the guy's name. I wrote it down, but you can watch the story and get his name, but Hans Hansen and whatever the other guy's name. The other guy is the one that drives it, and he's one of the lead engineers, and he is, um, he says that he's just trying to disprove the fact, like the design of the car, but he basically like does a sh shoddy job and makes the car roll over in front of all of these Japanese investors and they're like not investing in that no because they like literally watched him sabotage the deal like he rolls the car on its side and um <laughs> I mean he just does a shoddy job they just needed the car to be driven in order for these investors to get involved and maybe it's a good thing that they didn't get involved maybe it's a bad thing I don't know but the whole thing is just kind of wild so then um after this test drive, Dick, remember the reporter, he falls in one of the employees to um, a bar after this test drive and he um, basically pays him to be an informant. And, you know, because he tells Dick, you know, what a terrible time they've had with this test drive and, you know, they don't really know what they're going to do next. And, um, I don't know, he was just kind of beside himself and he was also intoxicated probably because he was drinking. But anyway, so Dick pays him to become an informant, and with this, he gets one of those plastic cups, uh, steals a cup, and it has Liz's fingerprints on it. So he gives it to his buddy, um, a sergeant in the LAPD, and he sends it off to the lab because they're like, who is this person that we, you know, can't find any records on uh, before she just pops up here, right? So, yeah, that happens. The informant gives them a cup. They're going to find out who this person is. And in the meantime, basically, uh, Liz and her family run off to, um, to Dallas, Texas. And the reason they do this is because the government has waived um, regulations so that they can create the car there. And they're looking for a manufacturing facility and all this, that, and the other, you know. And they're believing in, the, in this, you know. The whole idea, they're believing in Liz, they're believing in this, you know, she's going to get the 70 miles per gallon. Everybody's sold on it. Well, like, before, before Liz leaves to fly to Dallas, she has hired a commercial videographer to, you know, get all this footage of everything that's happening. And she was supposed to have prepaid him $3,000. I don't know what for, but she didn't pay him. So that videographer shows up at the headquarters for the 20th Century Motor uh, Corp. And he just walks in her office and is like, you know, this invoice needs to be paid. Well, there, when he gets on the other side of the desk beside her, there's, uh, you know, three uh, mafia, he calls them mafia looking men, you know, dressed in nice suits and stuff. And they're there and... Um, like looking all scary and he's just basically she gives him the three thousand dollars in cash and he gets the heck out of there because he's kind of like what the what's going on you know so later on the radio uh it's heard that you know somebody's been shot in the showroom of the headquarters somebody's been shot and it ends up being one of her bodyguards one of liz's bodyguards and he, you know, they struggled with the gun and one of them accidentally shot the other, basically, is a report on that. Um, 
And when, after this happens, and Dick, you know, Dick reports about that. Dick reports about um, basically her running off to go manufacture the car in Texas. He, um, show, you know, basically tells people to go and ask for their money back. Go get your money back because they bought an option and, you know, they're due their money back. So he videos them, you know, they get them on camera, you know, beating on the windows, asking for their money back and just not getting a response and, you know, just all the stuff that's kind of happening. And um, he pretty much reports that Liz has left him high and dry. Like, you know, sorry about your luck, guys. You guys just got screwed. And this word also gets back to authorities in Dallas, Texas. Because, um, you know, it's going to happen to them too. They're, she's going to go there. She's going to look for investors there. And they need to know about it. So insert Jerry Bank. So that was the assistant DA, and um, he decides he's going to go look at the Dale because the Dale's being stored in some storage facility, and he basically notices that it's nothing more than like a little toy kit car. I mean, it's not in any way operable. It's not up to standards. It's not got any of the things that you would think a vehicle would have at this point. So the DA issues criminal complaints against um, 10 of the officers of the 20th century uh, motor corps for grand theft. And I mean, this is for, you know, all the investors, all the investors who have invested money in the car, in the company, in the idea, whatever. So um, when, you know, Jerry Banks and the DA are doing this research, they're like, you know, no records exist of her before 1973, which is what Dick's been saying all along. Like, hey, we couldn't find records either. So, um, they get, authorities get, you know, a probable cause, arrest and search warrant, and it reveals, you know, in this, you know, mind you, they've come, they've moved to Dallas, Texas, and they go through everything in their home, and they don't find Liz, they don't find the kids or anybody, but they do find materials and garments that are used to appear as female, so they probably found, you know, some girdles and some bras or panties and um, things to suppress down, you know, your private area if you're a man. And so that's a little suspect for them. And then in April 1975, uh, Charles, his, his brother-in-law, gets a visit from the FBI, you know, saying, hey, we want to know where's your brother-in-law? Where's, uh, where's Jerry at? And he's like, I don't know, man, I don't know, and pretty much they threaten him, like, hey, if you don't tell us where your brother-in-law is, we're going to ruin and destroy your life that you have built and tried so hard to maintain, so he kind of narks them out, he lets them know, you know, that, um, you know, that, that Jerry is still alive, Jerry is living as Liz, and, um, we're, we're, she can be found at and so also while Jerry I mean uh, while Liz is being a fugitive again Dick gets a phone call letting him know that Liz Carmichael is actually Jerry Bean Michael man so this like <laughs> really gets his attention. And so, of course, he broadcasts it everywhere. He puts the story out there without, you know, anybody's approval in the office or anything. He wants everybody to know that this Jerry Dean Michael has actually been living as Elizabeth Jardine Carmichael. Shame on her. And um, so, in the meantime, they've actually, Liz and her kids, her family have run off to Florida. And the way that she gets caught this go round is that she had to run off abruptly without, you know, telling her kids goodbye and she felt guilty. So she ends up coming back and just to love them and tell them goodbye. And during that time, the FBI comes and gets her. Now, remember, she's so close and is such a good mom to these five kids. But what about all the five before those five? Like, think about it. The first wife, the second wife and the third wife, all those kids nothing to do with them like they don't exist but these five kids are special and she's overly involved with them 
and is, you know, like the number one mom, right? So, um, when, when she is caught, she tells the assistant district attorney that she actually has gone to Mexico, you know, to transition physically from, you know, male to female, and she went, um, in 1969 to Tijuana, Mexico, to, you know, to get the surgery done and to start the process and, you know, have her testicles removed. And here's the kicker. So when she's arrested, Liz is put in a male jail facility, but she's put in a room by herself. And that was one of the things that got me the most because, okay, like, I agree that physically, the way our bodies are set up, I believe men are stronger, you know, more muscular, have the ability to be more muscular than women. And, but I just can't imagine living my life as a woman and then being housed in a male jail facility. That was kind of like, I didn't know how to feel about it because I don't know. I just don't know how to feel about it. This is a bit much for me. So they kept referring to, and, and many times over, and not even just in this Liz Carmichael story, the media repeatedly reports on any trans people as um, a man masquerading as a woman. And that kind of bothers me because it's like, if you, I don't know, it just seems like if you lived your life for, you know, how many ever years as a woman every single day and you went through the trouble of physically having, you know, your testicles removed and having breasts implanted and all that, all those things that you really truly are a woman. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I know internally things may be a little different, but it's just hard for me to wrap my head around. Uh, anyway, so... Back to Jerry Dean. Back to Liz. She was arrested seven times and she's been a fugitive basically from every reporter reports that a trans person is quote masquerading as a woman end quote. I mean they didn't get it and I mean I can't even say that I truly get it because I don't but I just feel like saying that a trans person is masquerading as a woman or is a, is a man masquerading as a woman is a bit much. And every news report that found out that a person was trans would out them, like non-consensually out them. Like they just put them on blast. Like this person is, you know, used to be a doctor in New York, but now they're a tennis player here in California. Used to be a man, now they're a woman. I mean, that kind of thing bothers me because I can't imagine trying to live my life peacefully, do my own thing, and then you out my out me for what I've done in my past or who I am now or whatever. All that stuff just bothers me. So anyway, um, you know, Dick, the reporter, he just really has it out for Liz and he blasts Liz and saying that, you know, she uses people. She just really used those kids and what a terrible person she was to put her children through this and Vivian through this and how could she? And she just, he doesn't get it. Not that I do, but I don't know. But um, when 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 Liz is arrested there in Florida for the last time and extradited back to um, Dallas, Texas for those, um, you know, grand theft charges, Vivian is broke and destitute. And here she's got all these kids and no money. And so she, so she sells an interview um, that was enough money to get them, you know, back to excuse me, back to LA, not, um, not Dallas, back to LA to deal with those charges and to be with Liz. So Liz, like I said, she was taken to a male, um, a men's central jail. And at some point in time, she was supposed to be escorted by a deputy, you know, from place to place. And at some point in time, Liz is left unattended and she's beaten pretty severely while she was unescorted because she wore, she was required to wear a blue band. And that basically signified that she was a man dressing as a woman or whatever. And so the cops, I mean, not the cops, the um, other inmates knew this. And 
looked out for it and they took advantage of that fact that she was left unattended and like I said she was beaten up pretty bad she had black eyes and just really severely beaten um and when the the trial goes to court she just chooses to defend herself because her thing is you know if I get a court appointed attorney I've got a, an attorney that the people that are trying to shut me down and you know put me lock me up anyway they're providing it for me so do i trust that person no so she chooses to defend herself and she spends her time you know reading law books while she's you know incarcerated and um she actually requests a jury trial uh, as opposed to the other you know nine officers of the company and you know defends herself and what's crazy about this is that on the jury now mind you she's a trans person and on this jury is a minister's wife and she knew this minister's wife is you know shown on the documentary saying you know i knew they wouldn't pick me to be on this jury because i'm a minister's wife there's no way you know that goes against my values well this minister's wife you know she's in the going to the bathroom one day and she notices that liz comes in the bathroom too and she's like i'm gonna watch her i'm gonna see how she uses the bathroom well she sits down to use the bathroom which is her a key indicator that you know I really am a woman so believe it or not this minister's wife feels for her and you know changes her views and sees her as a woman just because of the way she sat on the toilet to use the bathroom but I mean it's kind of a an awesome part of the story because you wouldn't expect that from this little old lady I mean you really wouldn't but that just also goes to show that you know you're supposed to have a jury of your peers and how could this be a jury of your peers when you have, you know, a minister's wife on it? I mean, it turned out to work in, you know, worked out in her favor, but I mean, that's not your peers, right? Well, um, Liz, you know, uses the media coverage of the trial to explain that she is, you know, a trans woman and has lived as a woman as in the for the last eight years, and you know, I guess she took that opportunity to kind of out herself because Dick had been all over it and, you know, written a bunch of crap about her and she wanted people to know that, like, no, you know, I really am a trans person and I began this transition and this story is not about, this case is not about my gender. This case is about, you know, whatever the charges were, the grand theft. So, um, she goes there's a big win for her in this case when you know the judge allows her to present as a woman um in court based off of her partial transition like there was a whole hearing about you know should she be able to come in she need to dress as a man can she come in you know dress as a woman the whole thing so the judge decides hey we're gonna let you live as you are and um as you live your life which was as a woman so, anywho, the prosecution team puts on like 110 witnesses and they all claimed to have been working on the deal. You know, the big thing was that they, oh, they were just, you know, getting all these investors' money and weren't even, you know, trying to do anything. But all 10, 110 of them testified that, no, we were actually working on this car trying to make this thing happen. Well, then the jurors are taken to see um, a, the Dell mock up and they see it and it has no engine. And, you know, this the vehicle that they saw the Dell that they saw was you know requested that particular one bob a man named bob young uh young doll request yeah so bob young doll young dale requests for the jurors to see the Dell mock-up and the reason he does this is because it's so discombobulated and not in the form that you would normally see a car you know the engine's not there i guess the doors don't shut right there's some chicken wire holding some things up but it was just a mock-up it wasn't the actual real deal holy field it wasn't the vehicle and i think there was more than one like prototype out there and he specifically you know requested to see this one i don't know anyway dick carlson is uh sequest or sequestered what is it called um asked to come testify and he really you know 
took that opportunity in the courtroom to take jabs at Liz. He would purposely refer to her as a man, as he, and use, you know, those kind of pronouns. And the judge ends up getting on to him and it's like, hey, you know, use the correct verbiage here. And, you know, they, he tells the story about how he found out whatever. And um, supposedly also on the stand comes a jailhouse snitch saying that, you know, Liz has attempted to have the DA and other witnesses killed. And maybe that's true because she did have mafia ties. But who knows? I mean, just the whole story is <laughs> again just is freaking crazy. So anyway, in December 76, the trial ends. And, you know, like I said, Liz has defended herself to the best of her abilities, you know. And she has argued, you know, that she's credible because she was, you know, taken on GM and Ford and she wasn't able to fulfill her end of the bargain because the state kept getting involved, the government kept getting involved and interfering with her right to be an entrepreneur and, you know, take on the big three and, you know, really be a woman in a powerful position. That was kind of her argument. And, um, you know, I don't know. It didn't really work out for her. So on December 23rd, 76, one week into jury deliberations, uh, there was one jury, juror, 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 whatever. Anyway, hold out. And it turns out that this woman magically ends up with this really nice fur coat. And then she ends up in the hospital. And uh, claims were made that, you know, she took this bribe. And, but also the, um, one of the uh, bailiffs, uh, doctors forges a doctor's note basically saying that she couldn't come in so they decide the jury gets to rest without having this one juror hold out and because of this supposedly that's why she gets convicted it wasn't because she did anything wrong it was because this juror wasn't there to hold out okay anyway so yeah so December of 1980, what? That seems like a really long time. So this 76, they were in the liberations. And then December 80, uh, I don't know. Anyway, so she's sentenced to prison. Yeah, so Liz is sentenced to prison time. <laughs> That's not funny, but she's sentenced to prison time, okay? She's going to prison. And per usual, Liz skips out. She skips out of town when she was supposed to turn herself in. No, no. Mm -mm. She doesn't turn herself in. She's like, bump that. I'm not. I'm not turning myself in. I, don't, I feel like I probably wouldn't turn myself in either. I don't know. I wouldn't really do good on with the whole life on the run thing. I'm not that crafty. Anyway, so... In the midst of all this, because of, you know, her being outed on the media, it prompts other people to be outed on the media for being trans, and that's like a whole big thing, and it just was a mess. Like, I feel my heart goes out to all the trans people, like, that were outed like this, or just them, period. Anyway, so, after the trial, Liz and Vivian divorced. They still stayed close and stuff, you know, because of the kids and whatnot, but she was just tired of life on the run, you know, she was just over it, so the family, okay, Liz is on the run, and Vivian goes off to do her own thing, because she's tired of this whole, all the shenanigans, and being on the run, and just wants a normal life, and whatnot, so the kids, some of the kids decide to go live with Liz, who is on the run, and they decide, you know, they settle down in Austin, Texas, and she opens up, you know, a flower business. Just she buys flowers wholesale and goes out and sells them, sells them to the public and recruits people, you know, to sell and whatnot. It's an all cash business, people. So she pays the bills for this property that she has. She recruits people, homeless people, and they get to come work for her. And you know, they have vehicles to take them to work to the spots that they work. They come back and pick them up. They take them to the grocery store. They provide a house for them to live in. I mean, it's kind of a sweet deal. I mean, I guess it's kind of weird 
But then in a way, it's like not. It's like these people were homeless, and now they have a place to live and a job and money. I don't know. Anyway, so the, um, place my notes. Okay. On April 5th, 1989, Liz uh, and her family are in the living room, watch TV, and here comes Unsolved Mysteries. Because who's on the, show, on the show? Who's featured? Liz. Liz is featured. What? And her kids and grandkids are like, wait, what? What'd you do? Oh, my God. So, anyway, so the same day that that show airs, Liz is also arrested because she didn't try to hide herself. She's still living as a woman. She goes out. She grocery shops out with her family she lives a low-key life but i mean she goes out in public um so she's caught she's arrested and guess what she has to live out her 18 month sentence that she got you know all these years back and um she goes to another male prison again she's had this partial transition she's got boobs she's got you know no testicles she's you know, doing the dang thing, and she gets sentenced to a men's prison. And even in prison, she continues to live, you know, as a woman. After her sentence is over, she, you know, she gets out of prison, she goes back to Austin, and she picks back up on the flower business. My hair's sticking up. Anyway, so she goes back to the flower business, picks things back up. Everybody's houses are in foreclosure because nobody was paying the bills, nobody was doing things like they were supposed to. But she manages to save it all, save the day. Well, here comes this new reporter. New reporter in town. Oh, my God. So this new reporter moves to town, and he decides that he's going to do a story on the people selling the roses. Because he notices that, like, at every intersection, there are people selling roses. What's the deal? A day in the life of a rose salesperson, supposedly, is his, why, what, you know, the story purpose was. But... You know, he, you know, talks to one of, he interviews one of the rose salespeople, the flower salespeople, and, you know, basically finds out that she isn't paying her taxes and that she's got flower vendors that are kind of upset with her. I don't know why, it doesn't say. But so the, report, the reporter, you know, starts to develop this stuff, uh, story and he discovers old news on Liz and um, <laughs> I, I guess the story that he finds out, you know, is about her prison time and about how she, you know, was once Jerry Dean Michael and that kind of thing. I guess that's the story. And so he puts it on blast, you know. Oh, my God, she's this terrible person. And look at her helping homeless people, making them work for her and giving them a car to drive and, you know, a place to live, whatever. Anyway, so, that is just, let's talk about that for a second. It's just a tragedy in and of itself. Like, why are you so focused on her? It's not even that big a deal. Like, you could have done the story and been like, kudos to you for turning your life around. Kudos to you for, you know, helping the homeless. Why does it, why did it have to be made out into this bad thing that she was, you know, yes, it's bad not to pay your taxes, but did it really have to be like a big ordeal about her? No, it really didn't. It didn't. He could have left that out. He was just picking on her. Because she is used to be a man. Anyway, so um, at some point in time, poor old Liz, she falls and she breaks her hip. And because of this partial transition and just all the hype around her name and just everything, I guess, about her, she decides not to go to the hospital. And basically from the breaking her hip on is in a wheelchair. Bless her heart. And she also has diabetes, and there were regulations and things changed by the government around this time, too, where Liz's daughter wasn't able to travel to Mexico to get her, you know, diabetic medicine and hormones and stuff like that. So, of course, facial hair starts growing back, and um, just, I, I don't know, like, it just kind of rocked her world, I guess you would say. So, she's not able to take her medicine. And here she's been at it again. She's not paying her taxes. And anyway, she ends up developing um, a different kind of melanoma, carcinoma. And um, just really going through some things. I mean, it's kind of sad. And once the article comes out, you know, that that reporter does on her, she receives tons 
uh, or dozens of code violations. And, you know, she's just really haunted by the claims that she lived as a woman to get away with fraud, which was not the case at all. Like, all these years, she's lived her life as a woman, you know? So, you know, trans transness period was just constantly called into question and exploited, and people were like, I mean, almost making fun of the situation, almost making fun of, I mean, it's not even almost, they were. They were just really giving trans people a hard time, period. Employment-wise, housing-wise, whatever. They they were just like, screw you guys. So anyway, back to Dick. Dick ends up having done like 27 pieces on Liz Carmichael. And, you know, I don't know. He's just a piece of poo. By the way, his son is Cut Carlson on, uh, he's on some news thing. And it, I, it shows clips of him and it just makes me think that like, they're like one in the same and like maybe they're transphobic or something not sure but anyway so liz ends up dying you know she ends up going into a diabetic coma you know because the lack of her medicine is just really not taking care of herself you know there were just days she wouldn't even get out of bed and used to she wouldn't like that um and because they didn't have life insurance on her and stuff like that and just because she was such a she lived kind of this tumultuous life and transition in her body and stuff like that they chose to um donate her body to science so yeah that's the story of the lady in the dell and of liz carmichael and i mean it's just really to me it's just so eye-opening i hope you guys go and watch it if you already have watched it i hope you comment below and let's discuss it because i mean oh and you can suggest other things that might be similar that i can watch because i mean it really just it opened my heart and it opened my mind and to things that I'd never really considered before and um, I don't know I just value it. it it was pretty cool so I'm gonna do some other videos similar to this where where I discuss controversial topics and um, get feedback from you guys because I just I love it all anyway so uh, holler at me but don't forget to click like or subscribe to me and I'll make other content